This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It's hour three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's a Friday edition of the program uh, as we uh, broadcast to you today uh, from the South Coast. Uh, we're going to um, be spending our time with uh, our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield in the 206. Remember, folks, if you want to find out more about what Joe Sandberg is all about, you can go to aspiration.com forward slash revolution and, uh, you know, find out there. A great, great uh, candidate for office in the great state of California. And as we all know, a lot starts in the West and makes its way uh, across the country uh, to the East Coast and so forth. And not only in California, but uh, also uh, in the uh, great uh, Pacific Northwest state of Washington, where we find our next guest. He's always here on Friday. Sometimes move him a little bit earlier in the day, but uh, most of the time he's here in the 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific time hour. Uh, it is always great to uh, talk to our good friend, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, uh, the Renaissance man on the Jeff Santo Show, uh, the journalist, uh, the activist, and uh, the musician. Uh, it's always great to have MTC with us. Uh, happy... Friday, Mr. Hendrix slash Canfield. How are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing okay, Jeff. That's my excellent um, man. That's that's, that's your trademark s- intro. That's my. There you go. My, is that a was that a Stratocaster? Brain. What what kind of guitar is that? You have no idea. This is a one of a kind. It's called the Telluride, and it's actually a three quarter size guitar. It's black lacquer. It's really beautiful. The neck is a little bit flatter, a little bit whiter than a Strat, but it's really light. And um, so, because the neck is shorter than like a traditional Stratocaster or Les Paul Gibson Les Paul, there's less um, pressure on the strings, and so you can actually bend the strings really well in a way that I think Jimi Hendrix would like. You know. You know, just because the strings can go really. That's not with a wah wah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fingers doing that. So, yeah, it's really nice. It's my favorite guitar. And probably, you know, I don't know if anybody else would, would want to play it, but it's my signature guitar. And it's just the one that, uh, no matter how many guitars I have, and I have way too many according to my, <laughs> to my girlfriend, but uh, I have a. Uh, this is my favorite out of all of them, and it's not the most expensive. It was actually kind of a, a just a find that I, I found um, one day in a secondhand store, and it's turned out to be the best guitar I've ever had. So I love it. Anyway, that answers your question. I know we're getting really geeky about music, but the whole week for me has actually been geeking out on journalism. It's yeah, no, no, we want to get into that, uh, you know, that. spot on. Uh, very good stuff, but always good to start it off with a little uh, little Hendrix um, a tribute there. Uh, talking to the great MTC here on the Jeff Santos Show, he was uh, kind of hanging out with, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Selzberger, the Times, and uh, uh, and many others uh, well known in the, uh, the great profession of journalism. Um, you know, give me your quick takeaway from uh, this uh, this conference. Uh, again, the twenty second annual International Symposium on Online Journalism. It's a uh, night center for journalism and the Americans at the Americas, the University of Texas Austin, uh, UT Go, and um, it was quite. Uh, you know, seeing your notes, um, you know, in the email last night. Quite impressive. Uh, talk to me about your overview of what happened there, because I think, you know, people need to trust in journalism. They need to trust uh, not only in the New York Times, but they need to trust in the local newspaper, which uh, the town they live in and so forth. Uh, it's a critical component uh, to uh, democracy in America. And, you know, you want to have, you know, you don't want to have what happened, of course, uh, in on the Capitol in January 6th. Well, one of the ways is to have an informed uh, electorate. You know, people who listen to this show, you know, uh, know a thing or two about politics. Uh, we have probably maybe the most educated uh, audience in America, and I'm very lucky to do that. Uh, but, you know, we need more. And, you know, that's that's the problem that we have. And I think what, you, you know, was talked about over the week probably uh, can help in that direction. Uh, so give me uh, some of your uh, um, points uh, from what you heard. I think we just lost Mark. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, there you go. That's what happens sometimes when you're playing guitar and, and doing other things. We're going to try to get Mark uh, back with us here in a, in a minute. We have uh, connected once again with Mark Taylor Canfield. Uh, let's go to him. Uh, Mark, great to have you back, my friend. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. That was, that was my fault. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's been an incredible conference. Um, there have been representatives from, you know, the top level uh, um, of the field, top-notch um, movers and shakers in the field. As, the, as you said, the publisher of the New York Times was the opening keynote speaker. Um, you've had um, Catherine Viner, the uh, editor-in-chief from The Guardian, who talked a lot about uh, new models for journalism, which was one of the major topics Um and Marty Barron, the executive director for the Washington Post, who's been around forever, and yeah. Boston guy too. So much, so much information. Yeah, uh, used to be with the Globe. Yes, and then um, Evan Smith, one of my favorite guys at the conference. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Texas Tribune, and it's a nonprofit. Most people don't realize that, but it is a yeah, it's great a work. We model. actually are trying to get them on and talk about what happened in uh, in Texas a few months ago with their. Uh, uh, electric, um, you know, disaster uh, people are paying for environmentally now as well. Uh, they've done some great journalism. Uh, did you find that there there was underlying, I mean, we're talking just before you got disconnected, uh, that, uh, you know, the investigative component, something that you have, have, have valued, and, and, you know, I think it is such a critical piece of journalism locally as well as nationally, the investigative journalist, the print newspaper uh, you know the the local TV station that has one reporter and one producer that's out there, and that to me is a, a really critical underlying foundation of journalism today. Yeah, well, there were, you know there were so many important issues discussed during this panel, and I'll just list a few of them. That is one, definitely the 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 need for grassroots community journalism. Um, the need for and this is something that I've been preaching for a long time, but the need for uh, journalists who actually interact with the communities in which they live. And one good example of that would be uh, an, an, an organization called Documented in New York City, and they're part of this larger um, network called URL that was put together by some folks that are stressing diversity and trying to bring more people of color into the media and allow for more minority ownership and female ownership of media. So um, that... You know, there was a whole um, panel on um, the discussion of online violence against female journalists, because it turns out that 70% of journalists, according to the International Women's Media Foundation, 70% of, of female journalists say that they, f they felt threatened at one time or another online by somebody, usually a male. So that's an issue that corporate media isn't really dealing with directly. Some really cutting-edge information about immersive journalism, and here's really where the, the cutting edge, I think, of journalism is going to be, Jeff. It's how things like uh, photogrammetry, uh, virtual reality, and augmented reality are really adding new dimensions to the storytelling techniques that journalists have now. So they brought in a bunch of technologists from a, a very you know important group from the UK called Sketchfab. That was Thomas Flynn. So anybody who's involved in VR knows what I'm talking about there. But uh, also got to interact with Rita Hill, the professor from Arizona State University, Ben Kramer, who's an independent journalist technologist. And But we had this great breakout session because they have um, two other platforms called Wonder and Shindig where people are having these social events after the, the main sessions. And we were able to hang out with Mint, and she is from um, the New York Times. She's their creative technologist, and she has offered to help train journalists and, you know, join us on Democracy Watch News and explain to us the platforms that have already been developed uh, that are, you know, quite advanced in terms of uh, 3D mapping. Um, and we even had a session that went into the very advanced use of Google Earth where you can now actually just take your reader right into the geographic area uh, that you're reporting on and have them literally do a, re a virtual walk around the neighborhood you're reporting on and things like that. So it's very innovative stuff. A lot of corporate... Uh, media, the, the CNNs and MSNBCs and t those types haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, the technologists are definitely way ahead of the journalists and the editors on that issue. Um, you know, Jeff, I think one of the most important panels was called Reimaging News for Black Americans, and that was really yes. important. That was the keynote address earlier today, and that was from the co-founders of Capital B, which is a new uh, a journalism uh, project 
Um, and then Amanda Zamora was there, the co-founder and publisher of the 19th. So really important that um, people are addressing racial inequity in the media because it was pretty clear there was another panel called Race and Equity in the News. Um, and so I think it's pretty clear that the, the, there was a general theme running through this conference and it was great to have access to such high level, you know, top notch, you know, top of the profession people who would actually, you know, answer your questions and interact with you. It was really amazing in that way. But I think these themes of new media and how it involves much more uh, racial equity and an outreaching to people of color who have been shut out of the entire media process. Uh, there was a re realization and acceptance of the sad fact that, you know, the majority of media is owned by you know, a rich white men, and yeah. so it does tend to um, filter. And, and a lot of big corporations. Yes, there was a talk. I actually asked. Well, it wasn't just I, but myself, but um, uh, Marty Barron, the uh, executive editor uh, from the Washington Post, he addressed you know Jeff Bezos, Bezos owning the Washington Post, and now he claims that Bezos has never interfered in any of their editorial or news reporting. Uh, decisions. So I'm going to take him at, at his word on that. But, um, you know, I'm not sure that that is the answer. There are other people trying to come up with different ways of um, funding independent media. And I think The Guardian has a very successful model that they're using where you, you can be a subscriber and there's also some advertising. But you know what? If you want to contribute, they have that instead of a pay wall, it's a pay window where if you, or a donation window where if you want to contribute to what they're doing, you can. And I thought Catherine Viner's, um, the editor-in-chief from, from The Guardian's um, presentation was one of the best and, you know, really showed the way towards uh, modern media and how people can, can sustain operations like that. And disclaimer, yes, The Guardian uh, in, has interviewed me before about some of the protests and things happening in Seattle, but um, I really do think that that was one of the best presentations. But all throughout the conference... I was able to meet very innovative environmental reporters because, from the Society for Environmental Journalism because there was a session on climate change and how that's one of the failings, you know, of uh, modern journalism as well is, you know, not covering that issue. Um, there are so many issues that need to be brought up. The, the one issue that wasn't brought up, Jeff, that I was, was kind of, you know, lobbying for, for next year is a session on freedom of the press because Reporters Without Borders just released their 2021 World Press Freedom Index and the United States is now ranked 44th in the world in terms of press freedom. 44th? I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing... <laughs> I mean, what are we, 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 we there with Iraq and, and uh, Venezuela? I mean, this it's, you know, 44th. What an embarrassment. <sighs> well, it is to me as a, as a journalist working in the U.S., but I have to tell you that after speaking to, you know, a senior editor from The Nation and, you know, and today some pretty high-level people in both uh, corporate and nonprofit news agencies that I'm not getting a real uh, embracing response when I say that th this issue needs to be at the top of everybody's list along with of course, racial yeah. equity and e economic equity and all the other things, like climate change, things that are going on in this country, the reform of police departments, all of that. Um, but we also have to all be spokespersons, and, and I can't believe that I have to, you know, tutor some, you know, very professional people about basic journalism ethics when it comes to supporting democracy and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and very basic First Amendment rights. Um, it's our obligation as journalists, editors, publishers to speak in favor of those things. You're not crossing any kind of a political party line or any other kind of loss of objectivity when you stand up for human rights and civil rights. And some of these corporate people, I mean, you know, really need to get that uh, yeah. I mean, understanding. I'm interested in this regard, I mean, because you come from Seattle, and you, and, and obviously the protests there in 2000, uh, you know, were, were such a, a, a beginning, uh, a landmark for protests that have gone on since then. I mean, do they, do they talk about that in, in covering protests and, and uh, at the same time, you know, how journalists were treated? I mean, recently, you know, we hear about what happened in Minneapolis. Our good friend John, uh, who's been off this week uh, from Minneapolis, talked about, you know, how uh, journalists were... Uh, were just basically brutalized by the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and, you know, this has gone on, you know, in a lot of different cities in the U.S. Uh, did that get it all talked about? Well, for, 
first of all, I would advise the editors and publishers, uh, and I'm not going to mention any names, to stop making excuses about why the fact that we're ranked 44th in the world in terms of press freedom is not a number one story in their particular newspaper, magazine, online media, t television, radio station. So I'm kind of tired of hearing those, those excuses because I, I even got one from a professor today, you know, about why, well, you know, why there are other things that are more important. Well, to me, there are, are no other things more important to a journalist than freedom of the press. But we'll talk about that <laughs> another time. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, you can follow my coverage of all this uh, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. It's, I'm all over the place. I've even been doing live streams um, from the conference proceedings, which are all virtual, by the way. You know, we're all online. Um, but every day about 5 o'clock I've been live streaming on YouTube and then on Facebook yesterday. So I'm experimenting with a lot of these different form media platforms myself. And along with um, what you just mentioned, you know, the social networking platforms are obviously, you know, a big part of our job these days. So there was a lot of discussion of the usage and misusage of those, of course, and, and the disinformation and misinformation that's out there. That was another major issue in this conference and also in the conference that the EU put together that I was a part of. It's the same issue, you know, in Europe is how do you fight all this disinformation on, online. But to answer your question directly, yes, um, especially during the session on protecting female journalists, there was a, a big discussion about um, personal security when it comes to being a journalist. And, um, you know, I've given long pr uh, presentations about the rights of journalists and how to protect yourself when police are trying to arrest you. There, were, there was a discussion that I was involved with about um, what uh, what equates as an arrest as in, in terms of or as opposed to a detainment, you know. But obviously, in Minneapolis or in Minnesota, when the police have you know you cuffed or zip tied and forced you to lay down on the ground, you are being arrested at that point. You cannot release people and then say, "Oh, we didn't arrest any of reporters." That's happened to me as well, you know. So they don't even file an arrest report. They say, "Well, you know, no one was arrested," but that's her direct harassment of reporters, and that issue did come up during the conference, um, not as much as I would have liked to have seen. Right. Um, let me, but, you know, let me we'll, ask we'll you about that something that, to me, has always been bugging me and why I do a show and it's progressive. And, you know, I don't have a lot of Republicans on here, and even if we expand, I don't plan to have them either. Um, but I, I really feel that the idea of covering voter suppression with these 40 states is so the Republicans are involved with, there, there is no other side here. What they are doing is just blatant criminal and, and taking people's names, the Rodriguez's and the uh, Washington's and the Jefferson's, uh, because they sound African American or they sound Latino or whatever the case may be, Asian as well. And I just look at it, and, and there, there is no other side to this. And I'm just wondering how the Salzburgers in the world, if this was actually talked about, because to me, you have to ca cover this. But it is not, well, let's hear from the Republican side, and now let's hear from the other side uh, with uh, Miss Stacey Abrams, as an example. You can't do that. You have to look at the fact that there is an organization, uh, you know, the, whether it's ALEC or others that are funded by uh, our friends, the Koch brothers and so forth, that are out there trying to stop black people, uh, people of color in general, uh, young progressives who are white and others from voting. You know, I mean, they're doing everything, they're taking licenses away, or they take a license away. If you don't register the car in a state, of course, young people you know, have a hard time in college registering the car because that's another expense. I mean, these kids are living on peanut butter sandwiches, for crying out loud. So is there any discussion on that part? Well, wow, that's a, that's a big issue. Um, I would say that one of the best statements that came out of the conference, and by the way, one of my takeaways is that um, we don't all agree on any of these issues, by the way. So yeah. depending on whether you are a journalist with a corporate commercial network or, or news organization as opposed to somebody working with a nonprofit, you have different pressures and different uh, risks, and you also have um, different attitudes sometimes when it comes to your editorial department. Um, where nonprofits tend to be more interested in advocacy journalism. And uh, I can tell you right now, Jeff, that a lot of these new media groups that are popping up, they're going to be winning awards and setting standards and teaching the old school, you know, a trick or two. Um, they are, a lot of them, organized by uh, people of color specifically to cover First Nations issues or people that are involved in immigration reform or very specific audiences 
that their staff also re- reflects. And that's something new because, as we talked about before, the newsrooms have been very much dominated by the white power structure. So this is changing um, on a grassroots level for some news organizations. But one of the best statements I think that came out of the, the discussion that I was involved with um, was there's a bigger thing here that goes beyond party partisanship. It goes beyond any of the limitations that commercial or for-profit media might place upon you. And that is something called democracy. And it is uh, bigger than us. It's bigger than any particular nation and any particular um, state. So you have to honor it. And if you're uh, a journalist, once again, I'm always going to maintain, you know, and of course, I mentioned this kind of stuff in our Democracy Cast podcast or Democracy Watch News, I always have to stand for democracy as part of our mission is to cover pro-democracy movement. So uh, as a journalist, I am obligated, I think, and it wouldn't matter whether you were working for Democracy Watch News or CNN or any other news outlet, I think, or whether you're a publisher or an editor or a journalist, it is your responsibility and obligation to report on vote suppression, to report on pro-democracy movements and um, movements to suppress democracy. Right. And one of the questions that I brought up during the conference was, can you say that you have a free press if it's actually owned by uh, by a few very elite power groups and mega media monopolies? Right. And I blame. Well, I mean, just look at Fox News as an example of of what they uh, what they allow on the air. A lot of it is just pure BS and lies, and uh, that uh, that can't stand in democracy very long because then people get confused. That's why we're having this issue with vaccines right now, uh, as an example. You know, people don't know the difference. I mean, look, there is legitimate people who are concerned. Obviously, a lot of the African American community what happened in Tuskegee a hundred years ago. There are some, and in, 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 know that are young, uh, well-educated whites who believe that it's not there. But for the majority of them that are anti-vaxxers, they're coming from the Trump world, and they're completely clueless, and they're getting fed information that is outrageous. You know, from a a major news operation uh, in the world of Fox, and I think that's that has to be uh, dealt with. Um, you know, in some form or shape, and whether you just yeah. you know make it make it a, a clown show of what they're doing. Uh, and point it out that way. I got about 30 seconds, my friend. Go ahead. Seriously, that was a big discussion today. And, you know, it comes down to we have to do fact-based, even editorialism um, should be based on fact-based information-based um, journalism, not um, demagoguery and, and misinformation and propaganda. So, yeah, that's, that was a major issue today. And all of, the, all of the senior editors for the opinion pages for the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post were there um, saying the same thing. And so people have to be courageous, but at the same time, you know, be um, be fact-based in what you say. That's, that's no doubt. I suggest anyway. That's right. Hey, man, have yourself a great weekend, Mark. Always great. You can find out more at Democracy Watch News. Uh, enjoy yourself, my friend. Uh, we will uh, be back on Monday with uh, some of the bigger name in politics. Again, we're trying to get our friends uh, from New York, Bowman and uh, Jones and maybe Miss Bush uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so keep on fighting with us. Time for me to say I gotta go. This is the Jeff Sato Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together.